Good morning. My name is John Herbst, and I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlanta Council. Uh, we've got a wonderful program for you this morning on the U.S. relationship with Belarus with an all-star cast. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank Mike Carpenter, whose idea this actually was. Not that the rest of us here at the Atlanta Council were brain dead, but Michael really was the driver um, in outlining our event today. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Oleg Kravchenko, a Deputy Foreign Minister uh, from Belarus. Um, you have a biography of, of him, so you don't need to hear me repeat it. Let me just mention to you that he spent seven years here in Washington at the embassy. Uh, uh, most of that is chargé d'affaires, and now is responsible for relations with, with the United States and, and broader area than that. And with that, I'd like to invite um, Deputy Foreign Minister Kravchenko to the podium, and after that, you'll have a panel discussion led by Mike Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Herbst. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the Atlantic Council for arranging this event and inviting me to speak. I also wanted to thank the Jamestown Foundation and its president, Glenn Howard, for organizing a trip to Belarus of a group of high-level analysts November last year. General Ben Hodges, Mike Carpenter, General Bruce McClinton, former U.S. defense attache in Russia, were on the group. And this trip, I understand, was to some extent an inspiration to this event. Ambassador Vershbowl was in Minsk recently for the Munich Security Conference core group meeting, so we also have the latest from Belarus and from the region. This event's topic is Belarus dilemma. I think it could be read as an element of what's going on in Europe security and international relations wise. So I would like to first briefly present our take on that. Of course, I'm evaluating the situation in the region from where Belarus is, based on our history, on our alliances, on our perception of risk, and on our geographically being in between. And position of countries like ours, very unfortunately in my view, are less and less listened to and taken into account. It's becoming more like during the Cold War, when basically only two major actors defined all security matters in Europe. I don't think it's in anyone's interest. So I definitely appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I also sense that Belarus and comparable countries are viewed largely through the prism of confrontation in the region. No nuance is possible, and we are supposed to make a choice and to be either with one or the other conflict in center of power. In a way, this only contributes to further escalation and deterioration of security in the region. This choice, this dilemma between East and West that's been imposed by the current situation is extremely counterproductive, counterproductive and dangerous. Looking at the current situation from Belarus, observing the ongoing exchange of strong statements representing opposing rock-solid positions, I think there is not much sense in arguing on which side, which side is right and which side is wrong, who started the confrontation, who is to blame. The sides will never be able to agree on that. So that really leads nowhere. And I would like to quote OSCE Secretary General Mr. Graminger, who said at Wilson Center here in Washington last year that, and I quote, basic principles cannot be sacrificed for the sake of finding common ground, but repeating the same positions over and over again and expecting a different outcome isn't working either. We have in front of us a situation in which when one side makes a move, there is always a response. And every side believes it is responding to unfriendly actions of the other side. This is a downward spiral that has to be stopped. Belarus does have a special strategic relationship with Russia. We are in a political military alliance with Russia. And I do see more and more in the Western media in some analysis some politicians' statements, a notion of our relationship with Russia being a bad thing, being on the wrong side of history. I disagree. For we are linked by history, culture, religion, education, economic ties, trade and investments, industrial cooperation, many objective reasons. There are also vital economic interests of Belarus in the Russia's market. And the notion of our special relationship being a wrong choice demonstrates how deep the ideological divide is. 
But let us ask ourselves a hypothetical question. Imagine the unimaginable. Even the current fragile security situation in the region, Belarus was in the NATO, not in the alliance with Russia. Would my country be more secure? Do our neighbors, protected by the NATO umbrella, really feel safe and secure now? If anything large scale happens, it will happen right there in the neighborhood. So for us, it's not about who are we with, but rather about the current situation and the common risk. We all remember the outcry in the region in the run-up to the Zapad 2017 exercise. It's a biennial exercise, and as I recall it, every time it's held in Belarus, about a year before that, there is very vocal concern about the exercise from the West. When the exercise is over, it's forgotten. When the next one is on the horizon, then it is again seen as some kind of new, unpredicted, unexpected, sinister political military endeavor meant to threaten, intimidate the West, or at least our NATO member, uh, neighbors. We had heard figures like 100,000 troops in Belarus, heard that Russian troops or military equipment would remain in Belarus, and I was asked here in Atlantic Council in May 2017 where the Russian troops would remain. Some even said Zapa 2017 was preparation to attack our NATO neighbors. Remember all these articles about countless trains bringing crazy amounts of military equipment to Belarus like we were preparing for war? Nothing of these concerns materialized. I understand that in the current situation in the region, the exercise could be seen by the West as of more significance than usually. But let us not forget that military exercises are held on the other side of our border with NATO too. And there is military buildup right at our border. The exercises, just like ours, are positioned as of defensive nature only. So we shouldn't be worried, right? But we also tell our NATO colleagues, don't be worried. And it's another example of profound distrust between us. We're not interested in further escalation of tensions in the region. We resumed military-to-military -military cooperation with the United States in 2015. That sent a strong message and made it possible to restart defense cooperation with Germany, Great Britain, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. Absolutely not to counter-oppose it to our alliance with Russia, but as a measure to contribute as much as we could to diffuse intentions and rebuilding trust. And most importantly, to minimize possibility of small incidents due to lack of communication that could potentially lead to much more serious, devastating consequences. We are interested in better relations with the European Union and the US. The European Union is our neighbor and our major partner. We have shared historical, civilizational, religious, cultural, and educational roots. We are linked by economic ties, bilateral investments and trade, people-to-people -people contacts. And yes, that may resemble what I said earlier about our ties with Russia. We want the, boss, the best possible relationship with Russia and a normalized relationship with the West. We want to be friends with everybody, including the Euro-Atlantic community. I understand that it is so much easier said than done. Again, to some extent, because of the current logic of confrontation prevailing with regard to our region. A couple of words on Belarus-US relationship. It's been improving, there are some achievements. But we shouldn't be forgetting the very low base from which this improvement started. We haven't had ambassadors in our respective capitals from 2008. We have had very limited contacts for even longer. What's happening in our relationship right now is just a process of returning to normalcy. It didn't start during Trump administration. It didn't start in 2014. It started even earlier than that. So it's a slow process. When we do return to normalcy, when we have ambassadors back, and it will still take time, we will see if any progress beyond that is possible. I really hope it is. Thank you.
Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Carpenter. I am Senior Director at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement here in Washington. I'm also a non-resident senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm delighted to have this all-star panel to talk about uh, Belarus-US relations. Uh, you've just heard from Deputy Foreign Minister Oleg Kravchenko, who uh, was introduced by my colleague John Herbst. I'll briefly introduce the other members of the panel. Uh, we'll have a discussion moderated by me for about uh, another half hour, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience. So seated to my left is uh, retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who was the commanding general of U.S. Army forces in Europe uh, up until 20... About, about a year ago. About a year ago. Um, uh, he was with me in Belarus uh, most recently in November, as was alluded to and had an opportunity to meet with the Defense Minister, Foreign Minister, President, a uh, number of other officials. Seated uh, next to Ben is Celeste Wallander, uh, my former boss at the National Security Council, where she was Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russia and Central Asia. She is now CEO of the U.S. Russia uh, Foundation. Uh, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Kravchenko has been introduced, and then seated at the end uh, is Ambassador Sandy Vershbaugh, who is a distinguished fellow here at the Atlantic Council, uh, former ambassador to NATO, Russia, South Korea, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, I could go on and on, uh, also recently in Belarus. So we really have an all-star lineup uh, here to talk about the relationship. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Celeste, but before I do, I just want to make a few points uh, about the relationship between Russia and Belarus, which is where uh, I'm gonna take the question to you. Uh, it strikes me as an observer of this relationship that there are changes in the Russia-Belarus relationship taking place now, and there are at least three sources of principal friction between the two countries. One is over the degree of sovereignty that Belarus maintains going forward versus control uh, and diktat coming from Moscow. Uh, foreign policy, domestic policy across the board. Second source of tension, uh, which uh, is also very new, the, the first maybe is not quite so new, but the second, which is uh, rather novel, is the, what's called the tax maneuver. It is a, a process by which Russia is moving the way uh, that it taxes hydrocarbon exports from one based on an export tax to a mineral extraction tax. I won't bore you with the details, but what it means in practice is that the subsidies that Belarus has uh, received from Russia for the import of hydrocarbons and then processing of those hydrocarbons and, and further re-export are now being diminished almost to zero. Uh, and so what was a preferential sort of insider price, if you will, is now being phased out uh, and Belarus is being forced to pay uh, the same prices that uh, almost that Lithuania, uh, Poland, or other countries would pay uh, based on a, a single mineral extraction tax. Um, uh, third source of tension, I think, is geopolitical, um, and namely it is this. Um, if Russia currently, if the Kremlin right now, it feels unconstrained in confronting the West, um, and is comfortable taking the relationship to new levels of tension, uh, confrontation, and escalation. Belarus very much, if I understand correctly, and we can hear from Oleg later, uh, wants to avoid tensions in the east-west relationship. Belarus feels that its interests are not served by confrontation between Russia and the west, and very much wants this, this conflict uh, to either go away or for Belarus not to be a part of it. So those are three pretty significant areas of, uh, of tension. But Celeste, as Belarus takes small steps towards improving relations with the EU, with the United States, if we have ambassadors reaccredited in the next couple of years uh, between our two countries, how, will, how is this being perceived from Moscow's vantage? Uh, you spend a lot of time studying how the Kremlin operates, how they think. Uh, what do you think, how do you think they're viewing this uh, gradual rapprochement? Thanks, thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. And thanks to the Atlantic Council for including me on, 
on this panel, I would just observe one more thing about Sandy's bio that you didn't mention. He also was my boss. So uh, there's like a line here, uh, which it's especially welcome to be um, back on with, <coughs> with you all. Um, I, I hadn't thought of the three tensions the way you laid them out, Mike, but I, I agree with you. And I would, I would point to is that the, the, my concern is that not we face a replication of the Russia-Ukraine crisis of late 2013, 2014. Uh, because history never repeats itself exactly the same, but that some of the same elements are there. And in your lay, lay down, you, you actually laid the groundwork for pointing to those. One is to remind everyone that the crisis in, in 2013 and 2014 wasn't about NATO membership, and it wasn't about military or security in a, in a direct way, but it was about uh, the nature of the economic and business relationship between Ukraine and Russia, or more, more to the point, between Russian elites and Ukrainian elites, and steps that you, the Ukrainian leadership, having been elected on, the, on this platform, was taking to attenuate those relationships, or at least open them to greater transparency and competition. And that was the EU association agreement. And so, but what's intriguing about the tensions as you laid them out is the first step in this change is actually being uh, embarked upon uh, by a decision of the Kremlin to change the terms of uh, the subsidy, implicit subsidy relationship, which was an element of elite to elite relationships, not country to country relationships. And it comes though in the context of a Belarusian uh, uh, decision to seek a better relationship with the EU and the United States possibly in the context of security and political relations, but also in the context of diversifying trade, opening more to the European economies, making Belarus more open to the outside world. And in that sense, it poses the same challenge to the mechanisms of Kremlin influence. I don't want to say control, because that's a little overdrawn, but Kremlin influence in the countries that have been a member of the Eurasian Economic Union. And I think we should pay attention to that. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they thought it was a good idea to, to lay down the first marker on the change in that relationship, uh, whether it was meant to be a warning shot across the bow given the discussions with the EU. Um, but it changes the instruments or the methods by which uh, Moscow maintains control uh, in Minsk and in Belarus more generally. That then translates, even though that's an economic and trade issue and an inside kind of baseball uh, political elite uh, instrument of influence coming from Moscow, it does though step into or, or have implications for the security agenda. Because then it begins to look to a rather insecure and somewhat paranoid, again, is a little too strong, but I'm trying to think of what the word close to paranoid is, but not quite there. Um, view from the Kremlin that any uh, exercise of sovereignty, exercise of greater uh, stature in the international economy, any access to outside uh, kinds of resources on the part of Russia's neighbors, especially those in the Eurasian Economic Union, is immediately seen in zero-sum terms as a loss for Moscow instead of as a gain for a neighbor that is going to be more prosperous, more successful, maybe make up for the loss of subsidies. Uh, that is not the frame in which this is seen. And so I am concerned that uh, the West, we're, in a way, we're outside watchers on this relationship uh, for reasons I'm sure we all know and, and we, can, we can talk about. But I, I think one of the biggest mistakes we made in the fall of 2013 and in early 2014 was not understanding that Kremlin frame. And therefore, in some respects, either explaining away or underestimating what Russia was willing to do to prevent what it saw as a, a negative turn and in a zero-sum context. And I'm not trying to scaremonger, but I do think if we're smarter and we're more attuned to this and more proactive in understanding the stakes, we might be able to play a better diplomatic role to help prevent that kind of exacerbation of the situation that I think you laid out so well. So um, Ambassador Vershbau, if Russia sees the relationship between Belarus and the West in zero-sum terms, NATO appears to be sitting on its hands largely with regards to Belarus. There is no act, although Belarus is a member of Partnership for Peace and has been for quite some time, there is not an active agenda 
uh, that I can see coming from the alliance as such uh, to engage Belarus either in military transparency or other steps. Should NATO be looking at this relationship in a different way? Should there be more engagement? And if so, what would it look like? Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I, I do agree with the basic point that Russia does view this in zero-sum terms. That they, I think Belarus, because of its geography and its history, uh, and the fact that it is an ally of Russia, is uh, seen as a kind of element in Russia's uh, ongoing information war, hybrid war with the West. And I think that's why there's all this chatter in the Russian media about kind of bringing Belarus to heel. There's even speculation about annexation, which allegedly Putin needs because he needs to find a new job after the end of his term. I think those. I think Fle flesh that <laughs> out for the audience, if you will. This is the so-called well, the idea that uh, scenario, which Putin much uh, you know, doesn't want to change the constitution as he didn't want to do it when he handed over to Medvedev, so that he would kind of escape forward by making the presidency of the Union State his new perch to rule forever. This, this is uh, the, the new USSR <laughs> concept, right? Yeah. The Union of, of yeah. Slavics, uh, I don't know what the other S is for, republics. <laughs> and <laughs> there's other Putin is the new pr Union yeah, State And there are other president. arguments advanced in this that uh, he's worried about the security of the land c connections to Kaliningrad, or he kind of wants some new boost in nationalist enthusiasm for, by gathering in more of the former Soviet lands. I, mean, I don't buy any of this, I think. Russia has plenty of leverage if it wants to use it vis-a-vis -vis Belarus. And I think what's going on now is, is, is Russia is trying to tighten the leash. Uh, that's what's significant about the, uh, the uh, basically the elimination or virtual elimination of these subsidies that have derived from the, uh, the oil export uh, tax change. And uh, also pushing uh, this, Belarus, Belarus is not necessarily going to accede to it, but pushing to actually activate some elements of the union state agreement, including uh, common currency, common customs regimes, common judiciary. Uh, Oleg can explain this better than I. Uh, all kind of aimed at reducing Belarus's freedom of maneuver. I think NATO isn't being completely passive on this. I think there is something going on. Uh, when I was Deputy Secretary General back in 2015, uh, at the first high-level meeting, Foreign Minister Mackay came to NATO headquarters, and since then there's been a gradual expansion of the cooperative uh, activities under the Partnership for Peace. Nothing dramatic, uh, in part because there are bilateral issues with Lithuania and to some degree with Poland that have prevented the alliance from restoring the security agreement uh, with Belarus that uh, could unlock some additional activities and training courses and things like that. But there's been experts talks on arms control, transparency, they're talking about there's active cooperation on civil preparedness. So it's, it's not zero, but it's, it's very modest. In part because the, I think allies recognize that uh, a too tight embrace by NATO could uh, be counterproductive. I think that, uh, first of all, NATO's priority is, is Ukraine. I think that's correct. You know, the, the stakes for the international rule-based order, I think, uh, hinge much more on uh, wh whether we're able to support Ukraine's sovereignty. And if we can't do that, then Belarus is definitely not going to have as much freedom of maneuver as it deserves. Uh, and so even in things like the debate over uh, additional U.S. troops in Poland, the Fort Trump issue, I think there's a, a sense of caution in NATO that we don't want to kind of give uh, unnecessary pre pretexts to Putin to force the issue of a base in Belarus. Uh, but I think that reflects an understanding that Belarus can play a useful role if it's kind of not pushed too hard. It's, even though it's an ally of Russia, it tries to maintain a certain equidistance. Lukashenko, during this uh, Munich Security Council uh, conference visit, uh, styled himself as the, you know, the bridge builder, the mediator between Russia and Ukraine over the Donbass. And while I don't think Putin's going to listen all that intently to what Lukashenko recommends any more than he listens to anybody else, uh, there could be some value and you know, if there ever is a, an end game in these negotiations for Putin to say, I'm adopting the Lukashenko plan rather than the Volcker plan. Uh, so having a, a Belarus that can play a mediating role, also helping Ukraine by not imposing any of the Russian sanctions, uh, and allowing Ukraine not to have to concentrate forces on its border with Belarus because uh, Lukashenko has pushed back on 
uh, a larger Russian presence. So, uh, so Belarus plays a useful role, but Ukraine is the priority. So NATO, I think, is, is uh, acting us very cautiously, and I don't think that's necessarily wrong. So uh, General Hodges, you spent the uh, last couple of years thinking about how to make deterrence in Europe real and credible in terms of how the alliance puts in place the capabilities, the posture, uh, has the mobility to be able to defend uh, other allies in the event of a conflict. Um, talk a little bit about the strategic and military significance of Belarus in that context. When thinking about the defense of NATO, um, what, what is, is Belarus on the periphery? Is it marginal? Uh, what, what role does it play? And what should people who care about the defense of NATO be doing to to include Belarus in their in their thinking? So I think that uh, Belarus actually has the chance to be the critical, uh, play the critical role in security and stability uh, in Europe. Now, a quick look at the map shows that uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia have Belarus between them and Russia, except for uh, Kaliningrad. And then as Ambassador Versfeld just mentioned, you know, the northern border of uh, Ukraine also has Belarus there. So uh, it's in the interest of everybody that Belarus is able to live up to what we heard President Lukashenko say back in November, a, a sovereign country, self, self-reliant country. Um, and I think everything that we could do to support that uh, without, uh, as you described very well, uh, given that a false choice that Belarus had to pick east or west and that we certainly would not do something that would appear or look like a wedge between Belarus and Russia, which would certainly uh, give a pretext for uh, action by the Russian Federation. So that sounds to me like business investment. Um, uh, I think, frankly, for the last several years, uh, our administration had the wrong approach. Um, I tried for three years to get into Belarus to meet my counterparts, and I was I was turned down year after year after year by the State Department, um, and I and it, because it was seen as rewarding bad behavior, and I thought that was uh, a, a strategic error, a missed opportunity, not Hodges, but to have military contacts and, and and looking for ways to open it up. The map, as a commander of U.S. Army Europe, there was like this giant hole in the map that I knew nothing about, and it was Belarus, but yet it was in a geographic position that would affect everything that Russian Federation would do against the alliance in some sort of a kinetic or, or land operation. And so uh, I, I think we, we missed an opportunity there. However, now, uh, fortunately, because it has uh, been opened up and um, it's, something seems a little different. Uh, my, my colleague at SEPA, uh, Brian Whitmore, uses the metaphor of the or describes it as the emperor and the gamer. The emperor, of course, is the president of the Russian Federation, thinks imperially, whereas uh, the president of Belarus has to uh, balance and, and game, if you will, uh, his strategic uh, situation. Uh, we were in Lithuania uh, a few weeks ago. I was struck by how negative uh, the attitude of Lithuania was towards Belarus, or skeptical, maybe that's a, a better word, that, hey, look, this is cyclical behavior. They always do this. Don't be, don't fall for it. Um, I think this time it feels a little different. And for us, strategically, we should be looking for ways to sustain that uh, or encourage that sort of self-reliance so that there is no, there are no Russian troops that are inside Belarus. If there's no Russian troops inside Belarus, then you really, that should make everybody that lives in Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Ukraine feel uh, more secure. And it also, then, then why do you have to have a permanent basing with thousands and thousands of troops there? Oleg, I'd like to ask <coughs> you about uh, two related questions. One is how does Belarus perceive the Ukraine conflict? How does this play out in terms of your strategic thinking about your sovereignty, defense, um, the rest of it, your economic situation as well? And then two, how does Belarus perceive the Western or the NATO response to the conflict in Ukraine, which has been this very significant buildup with uh, what are called enhanced forward presence battalions, multinational battalions in the three Baltic states, 
more troops in Poland, more equipment being prepositioned in these countries. These are all your Western neighbors, after all. So how do you view both Ukraine to your south, which is uh, enmeshed in a, embroiled in a, in a conflict that has gone on for five years almost, um, and how do you view NATO's response to it from Europe, from where you sit in Minsk? Ukraine is an immediate neighbor. Ukraine is an important partner. And we just on some humanitarian level feel for them. It is happening very close to our borders, very close to, to Belarus. It's like everybody in Belarus has a friend or a relative in Ukraine. So we cannot be not paying attention to that even at that level. The second dimension, I think, would be uh, security dimension, our own internal security. We have a long border with Ukraine. It's not necessarily protected all along the way because of the history. And uh, for several recent years, there have been people participating in armed hostilities. There have been arms on the loose. So we have to also think about that from the point of view of uh, maintaining order and safety in our own country. And this is why we prosecute all Belarusians who participate in the conflict on either side of the conflict. And then, of course, the dimension of the regional security. Um, although technically or legalistically it's not a protracted conflict as hostilities st are still ongoing, it is a protracted conflict, unfortunately, in the making. And it is and it will be a destabilizing factor, not just for the neighborhood, but also for, for a wider European region. This is why we would like, we have been doing already what we could, we would like to contribute as much as possible to any attempt to peacefully resolve the crisis. Again, easier said than done. We do understand that our abilities in that are limited, but the fact that Normandy Foreman talks happened in Belarus, means two agreements were signed, agreed uh, in Belarus and trilateral contact group uh, gathers in Belarus and we are ready to continue to provide all conditions for these uh, for these attempts to peacefully resolve the the uh, the conflict we're ready to continue doing that again we're ready to look into any other possibility how we could contribute there was in 2014 a suggestion by President Lukashenko to put a uh, peacekeeping contingent in Donbass so it's not new. I know the current uh, difference on how it could uh, be done. We're looking into it. We have some ideas. We are interested in uh, making the region uh, and the region in Ukraine peaceful again. So this is our take on that. Enhanced forwarded presence is right at our borders. We think that it does create additional risk and challenge for security in the region. We do not see that as direct threat to security of Belarus. But it's easier for me to say that, being a diplomat, we often operate with some abstract information, wishes, By the way, that, ideas. That's a pretty remarkable statement to be making, that you do not see this as a direct threat. We don't. We don't. I don't think it's addressed against us, this enhanced forwarded presence. But again, it's easier for me as a diplomat to make this statement, but I don't think that uh, my colleagues from the Ministry of Defense can just as easily say that we don't care from their point of view. And I think that General Hodges may, may add to that. I mean, you have to think about some uh, equity balance in military equipment and preposition in a number of troops. But again, I don't think that it is against us directly. So that brings me to the question of Fort Trump, which uh, Sandy, you alluded to. Um, why don't I? A term I'd rather not use. But okay, <laughs> but why, why anyway, I start about with the issue, you yeah. and, 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 and frame it in a more neutral language. Um, if the United States were to proceed with deploying another brigade to Poland and creating a substantial military presence there, um, there has been this question now uh, for several years of whether Russia will build an air base in Belarus. And um, I want to get Ben's thoughts on this too, because I know we've talked about this. Um, when I met with President Lukashenko when I was serving in the Pentagon in March of 2016, he was very unequivocal with me that the Russians will not 
will not build an air base on our territory. It was like that, mm -hmm. said like that. Um, does a substantial US, a new US deployment and presence in Poland change the equation? And if so, is it um, upsetting the equilibrium? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, I, picking up where I, I left off, I think that uh, as we address this issue and try to shore up Belarus's sovereignty, uh, the, the European Union should actually be in the lead and NATO should be, be a, a kind of more of a supporting player in this. And I think that applies to how we should approach this issue of, uh, of additional U.S. presence in, in Poland. I think, first of all, the original Polish proposal for a whole brigade has been very divisive within NATO, much less with, uh, with Belarus or with Russia or anyone else. Uh, and uh, the, the Atlantic Council did a, did a report uh, with, uh, through a task force that I co-chaired with Phil Breedlove recommending uh, against a large brigade size presence with a, with a fancy base with uh, bells and whistles, commissaries, PXs, the works, which is what Poland, I think, would like. And, that, and rather that we look at a, a, a series of enhancements sort of more dispersed through the country, building on the capabilities we have in Poland, focusing on closing some of the gaps in NATO's deterrent posture that still exists even after the good work done at the, uh, at the Warsaw and the Brussels summits. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's the way to go to both ensure that this preserves the consensus inside NATO, but also to avoid giving a, a pretext, as I said, to the Russians. I, I think a very large presence would be seized on the Russians to at least exert more pressure on Belarus. Uh, whether that would be successful, all I could say. But uh, you know, I think it would change the debate on whether uh, Belarus needs to yield on Russian demands, which are, I think are real, to have an air base in Belarus or other plus up in its, uh, in its presence. So I think there's ways that we can bolster deterrence without giving Russia an easy pretext and help preserve this freedom of maneuver that is in our interest. I think we, we do want to uh, enable Belarus with all its problems and continuing concerns about rule of law and issues like that, but allow Belarus to continue to play this uh, equidistant role and to help uh, perhaps in uh, bringing about a solution in Ukraine as well. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I think the EU should be in the lead using the Eastern Partnership and the tools that it has there to help Belarus become more resilient, more able to resist Russian pressure, to be less dependent on Russian uh, energy exports and, uh, and the Russian market more generally. NATO should kind of just continue uh, on an evolutionary basis to expand the PFP relationship. I think the U.S. should help with Lithuania and Poland in defusing some of these bilateral problems that hamper a more complete Partnership for Peace uh, program, but, uh, but, but too tight of an embrace by NATO or a major buildup could uh, be counterproductive. So, um, Oleg, you want to jump in, then I want to turn to Ben. To yeah, you've well, written about Fort Trump, but go ahead, Oleg. I wanted to add a little bit to what I said about our uh, take on the enhanced forward presence. Uh, we do believe it does not represent a direct threat to our security, but at the same time, of course, I'm not saying that we are you know, not paying attention to that, that we are welcoming that, that we are saying bring it on, bring more troops, we don't care. Of course not. We are in a political military alliance with Russia, with all the consequences. If, again, if anything happened, that's the, that's the truth. But again, we don't believe it is, uh, it is threatening directly our security, but it adds, of course, to risks and challenges for security in the region. Eastern Partnership, an important instrument by the EU in relation uh, with six Eastern partners, us being one of the six Eastern partners. I think that from the very beginning, it should have been and it should continue to be only about the relations between the EU and these six Eastern partners not about relations of any of the six Eastern partners with a third country, with a third power. It is unfortunately not helping to promote the Eastern partnership, to really implement some of the very important goals that it has in its priorities for 2020 and so on. So it shouldn't be about confronting Russia, just because it is a different instrument with different goals. So Ben, you've written about Fort Trump and you've <laughs> recommended against it. 
Well, first, uh, our great ambassador Verspau talked about a big fancy base with bells and whistles. I, I assume he's talking about an Air Force base. Uh, I don't know any <laughs> Army base that would be described as fancy or having any uh, bells <laughs> Fort Polk, Louisiana, for example. But anyway, um, the safest part of the border of the Russian Federation is the part that touches Finland and NATO. I mean, these enhanced forward presence battle groups, you know, less than a thousand soldiers, maybe a company's worth of tanks. I mean, they could not make it through downtown Washington on a, a, during rush hour traffic. So this, this is zero threat uh, to any part of the Russian Federation. You know, we have such a better story to tell, and we just have to keep talking about what NATO is doing um, uh, to defend or to deter an attack. This is no, this is no threat, and, and they know it's uh, not a threat, and I appreciate what Oleg uh, has said. Now, um, the, the idea of a, something that's referred to sometimes as, as Fort Trump, uh, I do believe that it's unnecessary to have permanent basing. I'm, I'm not against it. Uh, I would love to see thousands of American soldiers from Estonia all the way down to Turkey uh, on NATO's eastern flank. I think the Alliance does have work to do to improve the coherence of its deterrent efforts, taking all the great work that's been done from the uh, NATO, uh, uh, Wales Summit, the Warsaw Summit, the Brussels Summit, I mean, you see a giant, uh, large, multinational institution, very agile, uh, adapting to the changed security environment, uh, and you've seen the United States commitment that started under the previous administration has been commit continued under this administration. Uh, there is already a substantial American presence in Poland, thousands of troops, a logistics base, the Air Force is in and out of there, uh, Aegis Ashore will be ready probably in about a year. Um, the Poles, great allies, modernizing. Um, so there's already a lot happening, uh, but the real deterrence is not having a permanent base, um, something that's seen as a permanent base. It's a cohesive alliance where there is no doubt that 29 are committed to each other. And I do wish, of course, our president would, would stop causing confusion. The, the tweets don't match what's actually happening on the ground. I mean, this administration has continued forward everything that the previous administration said, plus, and maybe even more importantly, the Congress, uh, House and Senate, you know, from legislation, but also the continued increase in European deterrence initiative money. These all show real commitment. And so um, cohesion of the alliance, I think, would be potentially uh, degraded uh, unless, unless the U.S. did all the diplomatic work necessary to bring along the rest of the alliance. Um, to do uh, have what would be described as a, a permanent uh, permanent base. So my uh, the burdens on us, not the polls, to make that case to to get that level of cohesion. Now, uh, I think that Germany has a critical role to play here. The polls want an American base there because they are not sure that Germany will show up. Uh, they're not sure that the Germans will actually help. Um, and so Germany, uh, could take on a, um, a, a multifaceted role, both through the European Union with Belarus uh, and in the rest of Eastern Europe, but also militarily, um, so that there's not a single pole who wonders, will Germany actually be there? Um, and that would, I think, would obviate this uh, somewhat, the, the desire to have uh, a permanent base. The last point I would make, uh, we have an opportunity coming up um, with the exercise Union Shield. You know. Um, my friend uh, Oleg talked about the, the Zapad and probably the overreaction. This is probably the only thing I disagree with you uh, from your uh, excellent remarks this morning, Oleg. The, uh, there was no overreaction to Zapad. Um, I think there probably were 100,000 troops involved, but only about 12,000 of them were actually in Belarus. And this was, hey, look over here, invite all the attaches to come to that. In Belarus, I think President Lukashenko took, took significant risks to do what he did. But there were about 90,000 Russian troops exercising all over the rest of uh, the Western Military District. And uh, somehow they were able to draw a little circle around Belarus and say, here's Zapad, and therefore all this other stuff that's going on doesn't really count. Don't worry about it. But that's, this is where they were practicing with uh, drones, live fire artillery, um, exercising things, uh, significant capabilities, which is fine, but it was a complete lie the way they described it. So the, if Russia was serious about you know, peace and stability and security, a little bit of transparency like we do in the West where we have observers from Russia, Belarus, uh, other countries as well as journalists inside every platoon of, uh, of every exercise. 
Union Shield, so Zapat happens every four years, Union Shield happens in between. So actually there's a big time exercise with Russia and Belarus every two years. And I think uh, certainly our organization, the Center for European Policy Analysis, is just gonna do a, a Union Shield watch uh, the way we did a, a Zapad watch this year and, and encourage transparency. And I wonder if the Russians didn't shift their exercise as they saw this increasing uh, attention like maybe they hadn't had in a long time. So I don't know that what happened was the original plan. I think they probably made some adjustments um, in messaging as well as in uh, actual uh, execution. And 12,000 troops in Belarus wasn't picked out of thin air. There's a reason why it was 12,000. Yeah, that's just below the, uh, the threshold there, um, which again demonstrates and, and why some Western European countries, in particular Germany, uh, want to give them a free pass. And not and not shine the bright light on, on what it is uh, they're they're doing. It. Um, that number was um, picked uh, for a reason. You're exactly right, Michael. Can I talk Threat? about? Yeah, please. Things? And then I've got another question for you, Celeste, that shifts topics. So I just topics. Want, uh, very quickly then. Um, I I want to endorse the 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 frame that you've heard from everybody on this panel of not accepting the zero sum frame. That and I, I just want to point out that just because another participant or player in a, uh, a diplomatic or security challenge frames things in zero-sum terms means that you need to accept that frame. You, need, you know, American national interests and American strategy needs to be driven by our assessment, our interests. And I think there's a tendency in commentary, not at the Atlantic Council, of course, uh, to sort of immediately become zero-sum in our own thinking just because of that frame coming from Moscow in not all, but in many instances. And I'm, I just want to endorse the, the wisdom and the thoughtfulness and the strategic analysis from my colleagues up here. Um, uh, just to the, the Russian reasons for the air base, I think that there's a political reason and then there's military reasons. Uh, the military reasons, you know, so more is always better if you're a military planner. Well, maybe not, but yeah, there is a tendency to see more is always better as a military um, planner. And I, and I think that it's important to remember that Belarus and Russia actually have uh, a, an agreement, a treaty on joint air defense and on a, a joint defense of the borders of, of the Union agreement, the, the, the borders of, of Russia and Belarus. So Russia already has a legal, a legal basis for should there be a crisis to be involved in some kind of operations. But that has to be with the agreement of Belarus because it is you know, a, a joint agreement. And I, I worry a little bit that that agreement uh, becomes a, a pretext in the event of a crisis and an air base gives more meat and capability to drive that as we saw in Ukraine. Because there was an agreement on the Russian basing of forces in the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, um, but that agreement limited uh, Russian movement in Crimea and was uh, conditioned on agreement with Ukraine as the sovereign entity uh, to which Crimea belonged. And that quickly got brushed away and pushed under the rug. And, and part of the reason was is that the Russians were able to pretend to the international community that they were only reinforcing a base in Sevastopol as opposed to invading Crimea. Um, so I, I think that there, there is a, a bit of a, a political military reason for seeking the base. Um, I'm not saying they're planning an invasion of Belarus, but it thickens the pretext for operating uh, if it should be the case that they don't have agreement from Belarus. The other, the other reason is that um, Russian military analysis is that we, without, even without a, uh, a permanent American presence in Poland or somewhere else, uh, that the actions that the United States and NATO have taken under Ben's uh, leadership, under Phil Breedlove's leadership, have complicated. If you're going to do contingency planning for military operations from the Russian military point of view, these uh, complicate the ability to move quickly, decisively, and with impunity. And uh, a, a forward air base would help mitigate some of those disadvantages, just on a purely analytical um, base. So I think there's a real military analysis underlying that as well as the political military um, base. It, com it, doesn't, it may not be a threat because it's defensive, but it absolutely complicates Russian military planning. And you know, that is a, a measure of the effectiveness of the deterrence capability that NATO has uh, developed since 2014. So we should take that seriously. I, I agree that we should not accept the threat narrative um, and we should be clear about what, 
what is and is destabilizing and it isn't destabilizing. But this is a this is a serious complication mm -hmm. for um, the Russian military planning, and they would like to mitigate that by having even more forward-based capabilities, and that's what that air base is about, I think. Sure. Um, I will come back to you, Celeste, on, on a different topic, but while we're still um, in term, talking about relations, NATO, Belarus, Sandy, you alluded to the, there's a disagreement between Lithuania and Belarus. It centers over this power plant called Ostrovets, uh, which is um, right on the border between Belarus and Lithuania, very close to the Lithuanian capital of Vilnius. Um, this has been an impediment towards greater Belarusian cooperation with NATO because Lithuania has essentially blocked it. Yeah. Is there a way to, um, to get beyond this impasse? Um, is there a way to use this, um, this nuclear power plant to, to build trust? Or is, it, or is it really a hybrid threat? The Lithuanians that I've spoken to see this as a potential hybrid threat in the sense that the plant or rumors of an accident at the plant can be used to instill fear uh, in the population. And that uh, given the history of Chernobyl, what else has happened with Russian nuclear power plants, that this is something that, uh, that they're very concerned about and they're not happy that it's being built on their border. Is, is that gonna remain uh, an impediment to cooperation for the next decade or is it only around on the panel. I mean, I think uh, the plant is supposed to become operational this year. Is yeah. that right? Uh, and then you know, the, the safety concerns are certainly understandable. And I, I, I know Belarus is trying to reassure the Lithuanians that there are adequate safeguards. Maybe this is again an area where the EU could assist if, uh, if that's legally permitted to kind of provide an additional measure of uh, oversight and security so that uh, the Lithuanians are reassured. I mean, at the end of the day, I think they need to think about the larger strategic stakes involved in the relationship with Belarus and Russia whether uh, maintaining this, this, this blockage at NATO is, is still achieving anything beyond the symbolism of sort of showing that they're angry about the, uh, about the reactor or, or not. Uh, uh, but I think perhaps some additional initiatives on safety could at least reassure both the Lithuanian government and the public that uh, there are measures in place to mitigate the consequences of any accident, but that uh, uh, you know, enough safeguards are uh, in place to make such an accident very unlikely. And then there's the, you know, the opportunity that could be there in terms of reducing Belarusian dependence on Russian energy supplies. I mean, that would be a big leap from where they are now to actually see uh, buying some, some electricity from, from this plant uh, as a way of uh, you know, depriving the Russians of some of their energy leverage, both vis-a-vis -vis Belarus and, uh, and Europe. Uh, that may be a, you know, f far too difficult given the politics of the issue, but uh, I think the larger question of reducing Belarusian dependence on Russia and making it more resilient to Russian pressure is in everybody's interest, including Lithuania's as a neighbor. Uh, so we should continue to talk with Lithuanians about right. that. Right, although Rosatom will be operating the plant for the mm -hmm. foreseeable future. Um, Celeste, what I really wanted to ask you before was about, so you run the U.S.-Russia Foundation, which is involved in engaging Russian society, how the U.S. can engage Russians, ordinary Russians, of all stripes. How should the U.S. be thinking about engaging Belarusians? We don't have hardly any mechanisms of engagement right now, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is part of the reason why the government-to-government -government engagement has been so stymied over these last few years or decade really mm -hmm. because there is a complete blockage in terms of our interactions our knowledge of what's happening uh, in Minsk and elsewhere in Belarus what would you recommend um, if you were in government uh, or outside of government what sorts of things should we be looking at to to pursue greater engagement with Belarus and civil society but just society at large well, assuming it was politically palatable mm -hmm. and there were resources for it, I think where you start is um, in uh, education exchanges, either sending America. Um, one of the problems these days, given where U.S.-Russia relations are, is it's hard for many American undergraduates and graduate students to do a semester of intensive Russian language study. There are still some programs, but a lot of students end up going 
to Kyrgyzstan um, or uh, to Estonia, all of which is fine and lovely. Um, but it, you know, simply being able to perhaps spend time as an exchange student learning about Belarus, but you know, obviously a lot of the education uh, programs are run in Russian, would be a, a, a net positive opportunity for American students. And creating a, a fellowship uh, funding universities that would like to do uh, exchange programs for students from Belarus in American universities, whether at the undergraduate or graduate level. And then at the faculty level, think about facilitating exchanges between counterparts in science and, and technology uh, across the board. These sorts of things really matter um, over a long period of time. And the point isn't to have an impact this, you know, sort of this semester and do you get a new uh, breakthrough in artificial intelligence or in, uh, in medical research, but it's those often those relationships that lead to breakthroughs 15, 10, 10, I was going to say 5, 10, 15 years down the road, um, especially if you invest in younger professors who are you know, at the beginning of their scientific career. And I know that a lot of the European focus, the EU focus, has been seeking these kinds of um, ties, and Europe is very good at this. I think the United States was great at this in the middle of the 20th, 20th century, but we've really fallen behind in valuing these kinds of investments that are not, don't have tangible effects but end up having really important effects later on because you're building human capacity and there is going to be a next generation of leadership in all of our countries and those are the people who it's valuable if they have experience outside their own country and uh, they understand how other, other minds think and know who to pick up the phone and call uh, when they need to understand something in the future. So that's exactly where I would start. I would hope that would be politically uncontroversial. Uh, even you know, in a broader uh, political relationship that's still developing. Um, and that's what I would recommend that someone get to work in talking to Congress about being willing to advance. So Oleg, I want to get your reaction to that, but also <clears throat> ask you, given what Celeste has just said, but also you know, my visit to the IT park in Minsk, um, you know, it's a pretty impressive space. A lot of young people, a lot of Silicon Valley companies are outsourcing their programming capabilities to uh, Belarus. Um, not just Sil Silicon Valley, but European tech companies as well. Um, and that sort of seems to be a trend amongst the younger generation to really invest in tech knowledge. Um, how, what do you think about this idea of exchanges? And, and fundamentally, where do you see Belarus 10 years from now? I mean, where would you like to see Belarus 10 years from now? Like what sort of relationship with the EU, with the West, um, in the on the global stage uh, would you envision? I agree wholeheartedly with your idea of uh, more exchanges of creating some programs for Belarusian students in US universities. This would only be helpful. We do have some exchanges now, definitely not enough. So this is an area uh, on which we should uh, really work with the American side. Where do I see Belarus in 10 years from now? You know, the history has compressed so much and the events now that 10 years seems like 50 years some time ago. So it may be a little bit a stretch to suggest any prognosis, but we would like to see ourselves as independent country in a peaceful neighborhood with no confrontation and still rising tensions maybe with some disagreements, some disagreements may be unavoidable, but again, disagreements that do not create a possibility of uh, a military conflict. We would like to see ourselves in 10 years in a, again, strategic special relationship with Russia, but at the same time, in a normalized relationship with the West, with the EU, with the US, having a partnership and cooperation agreement with the EU because basically this partnership and cooperation agreement is an instrument for two dominant trade regions that we have in Europe to cooperate between themselves. And I think that now it wouldn't be feasible politically, but in some years I hope uh, we may be able to revisit the idea of creating the common economic space from Lisbon to Vladivostok, again, not now, but in the future. And I do believe that it would be very uh, useful, not only regarding economic ties, but also to minimize political tensions, the, the conflict potential in the region. And I also wanted to add, uh, this is already beyond the question that you asked, 
I wanted to take issue with a methodological approach that you're using when analyzing Belarus. I'm not sure that we should always be seen from, through the prism of what has happened in Ukraine. There are some systemic differences between <coughs> Ukraine and Belarus. I mean, it is an independent country, a neighbor. It has identified its way of development, the path. So we respect that, of course, but these systemic differences at least some of them, we are in a political military alliance with Russia. We do want better relationship with the West, but we've never in any format, publicly or privately, have asked for European perspective, for the future uh, potential membership in the European Union. So there are some serious things that really differentiate the situation in Belarus uh, from from situation in Ukraine. So. Um I realize that it's actually not 9.30. It's <laughs> yeah. the clock has stopped. It's more like 10.05. I'm going to open it up for questions in one minute. I'm just going to ask one last rhetorical bomb here. Um, uh, I'll direct it to whoever wants it. But, um, but the reality is, well, let's be honest. The reality is Belarus is an authoritarian state. And human rights are a major issue in terms of our bilateral relationship, uh, the US and Belarus. The question. And maybe I'll direct it to Sandy, uh, since, uh, since you've got uh, a lot of experience with these sorts of relationships um, in, under Partnership for Peace and, and outside of it. Um, the question is, does human rights, is, is that the, do we put that as the prerequisite for engagement, or does pushing on human rights related issues and democratization flow from engagement? Um, which is kind of how I look at it, but I, I think it's a crucial pillar of our relationship that we can't neglect, even though this panel is mostly here to talk about security issues. Yeah. No, I would view it as your <coughs> second model, that uh, we should engage. Yeah. Uh, there are strategic reasons to do that, but we should also push, and I don't know if the Trump administration is ready to do this, but I think uh, we should uh, push, push the administration to do that, working with the EU to continue to raise the need for human rights reforms, rule of law, more transparency, anti-corruption, all, all the kinds of reforms that Belarus needs for its own sake to become a more stable and resilient country, um, but also recognizing that the, it'll put a uh, failure to do that will put a break on uh, the ability to advance uh, along the EU track towards, uh, you know, I would hope maybe in 10 years you could have an association agreement and a free trade agreement with the EU, uh, which Moldova as well as Ukraine and Georgia have, have been able to do. Uh, but be careful about applying strict linkages because there are larger strategic stakes uh, that argue for uh, engagement uh, now uh, to try to kind of preserve the, the freedom of maneuver that Lukashenko has uh, established and is in our interest for him to maintain. Great. Thank you. All right. With that, I will open it up to questions. I'll start with you, sir. <coughs> Oleg Merkulov, uh, VSTLV Media Group from Riga, Latvia. I quite often go to Daugov Pils and Kraslava, uh, not too far from Belarusian border. Once I even almost crossed the border, I was driving through the forest, almost crossed the border, turned back on time. So uh, it was not, you know, it would be a dangerous probably to cross. But uh, the question is, uh, I know that in, uh, uh, there is a visa-free travel as long as you land in, uh, at Minsk airport, as far as I know, right? For everybody, for American citizens, for European citizens. What are the prospects and what's your Belarusian position on uh, uh, making visa-free um, uh, travel uh, in a regular uh, European uh, Belarusian uh, border crossing. Uh, probably it's an ideal world, but you know, what are, what are the conditions and uh, what are the obstacles for, for doing that? Thank you. Okay, that's a question for you. It is a process. It takes time. It was relatively recently that we extended the term of this, I would still say, quasi with a free uh, conditions of entering Belarus from five, five days to 30 days. And uh, I, I do not rule out that we will approach the possibility of uh, also introducing the same, the same regime at the borders with the European Union. But again, takes time. It is, to a large extent, a technical process too. Different services are engaged, so everybody has to be ready. I personally do hope it will be sooner rather than later. I can see such a perspective and possibility, and I think it would be useful. But again, 
One thing at a time. Okay, sir, here in the <coughs> second row. You could also introduce yourself before asking a question. Dmitry Kirosanov of TAS. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I have a question for uh, Minister Kravchenko. Um, I was hoping you could flesh out your talk. You could talk a bit more about the two countries moving to restoring a full-fledged diplomatic relations. You said something to the effect that it's not, it might, it will take time to restore the ambassadorship in, in the respective capitals. So how long do you think it will take? Do you have a timeline in mind? And what about, the, are you really lifting a cap on the diplomatic presence in both Washington and Minsk? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The cap has been lifted. That's true. We don't have a timeline. We are still approaching, together with the American side, a decision to return ambassadors. So there is no yet decision made to return ambassadors. When this decision is made, it will still take, I think, months, if not years, and most probably years, for us to come to the stage at which we will see ambassadors in our respective capital. So still, I don't. I think years rather than months. There, gentlemen in the third row. Thank you. My name is Kastas. I'm from Embassy of Lithuania, which was mentioned here many times. Uh, regarding the pessimism from Lithuania, as uh, General Ben Hodges mentioned, um, I would probably put in another angle because Lithuania is uh, uh, very much engaged with Belarus, especially with, uh, as, as you know, we have uh, Belarusian University in exile, we have uh, very tense people-to-people -people contacts, they are coming to Vilnius you know, on weekends, we have visa facilitations, uh, things from our side. Uh, so there is this willingness from our, from, from the Lithuanian side. Regarding the Ostrovets nuclear power plant, well, of course the concerns remain, the concerns are not from Lithuanian government as such uh, only, but from our people, from Lithuanian's, uh, Lithuanian population has overwhelm overwhelmingly said that this is uh, a threat to them. And they say uh, the same thing is being said also by Belarusian people. And the questions remain why this location was selected, first of all, which is geolog geologically the very kind of the, the, the most unstable uh, location in, in Belarus. The transparency of, of, uh, of many things, including the accidents that happened, many accidents that we learn from the press including the accident when the nuclear reactor was dropped. So these concerns remain, they are unanswered, that's very logical and naturally that, uh, that the concerns remain. So these are short comments, but my question would be, I also wanted to ask what uh, Mike asked about the 10-year perspective, but the question was asked, but can you, uh, Mr. Minister, elaborate on this, that, that you, in your answer, mentioned strategic stability, strategic special relations of Russia. And, and can you elaborate what do you mean by that in 10 years perspective or in five years perspective? Thank you. Thanks. I think I meant a special relationship allowing us to trade freely, to have unobstructed access to uh, the Russia's market, to be able to pursue projects in industrial cooperation, uh, to cooperate with Russia also within the framework of the Eurasian Economic Union. And again, I do uh, believe that the European Union should start talking to the Eurasian Economic Union because this is not happening yet because of a position on a certain issue of just one member state of the Eurasian Economic Union. I think it would be better for everyone, for the whole region, if there is uh, a communication. They have started some very low level uh, technical communications between the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union. It should be continued. So what I meant to say also was that there is no plan in Belarus to turn our back on Russia. It will always be a strategic partner. It will always be a special relationship for so many objective and subjective too reasons that I have uh, named earlier. So this is what I meant. And since you mentioned the nuclear power plant, 
I believe the main problem is that, I mean, the sense that I get from talking to our Lithuanian uh, partners is that nothing short of closing down construction or shutting down the already operational nuclear power plant would be enough for Lithuania in this dispute that we are having. And this is simply not going to happen. It will become operational in the end of this year. You will see in several years that it is a safe nuclear power plant. I do hope that the concerns you have will start to fade away from our bilateral relationship as the nuclear power plant works. And you also know that we have been cooperating with the IAEA. We have voluntarily agreed to do what we were we didn't have to do to go through the EU peer review stress tests that are designed only for EU member states. We have done it to be transparent, to show to you that the nuclear power plant is safe. Um, the contractor is Rosatom. The same project by the same contractor will be implemented in Hungary, in the EU, and in Finland, in the EU. So, this is how we see that, and again, it will be operational, and I don't see such a big problem. Okay, uh, all the way in the back. <coughs> George. George Bisky, a member of the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'd like to direct my uh, question to uh, Dr. Krauchenko. Dr. Krauchenko, you uh, expressed the view in answer to Michael Carpenter's question that uh, in the future, 10 years, five years from now, your vision and hope is that uh, Belarus will be uh, uh, enjoying um, friendly, cooperative relations with Russia and uh, all its neighbors, and that uh, you'll be able to concentrate on expanding trade and cultural relations and this kind of thing. All this sounds very, very nice, very ideal and idyllic. How do you reconcile that vision and that hope with the fact that up to now, Russia, led by Mr. Putin, has not, uh, has not uh, uh, demonstrated the reciprocal kinds of visions? Uh, in fact, Russia has demonstrated, has said verbally, and has de demonstrated by its actions that its goal is to reconstitute the Soviet Union uh, politically, culturally, and through the Ruski Mir, etc. Uh, they demonstrated this in Georgia, in Ukraine, Crimea, Moldova. Um, how do you reconcile Russia's actions and stated goals with your ide idealized vision of relations? What will make Russia change its behavior in order for your view? to be real, in your view of relations, to be actually realized? And do you think that maintaining this view is the best guarantee of Belarus's continuing sovereignty? Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, First of all, I believe that reconstruction of the Soviet Union is not possible. I do not think it is possible. Second of all, our relationship with Russia is a complex relationship. It is a developed complex relationship in terms of having many projects at many levels in different areas. And such developed relationships are never very easy. There are always issues to discuss, differences between countries that have such developed relationships. I do understand that now, because of the most probably, I think so, current tensions in the region, the press, the observers see a bit more 
in what's on the surface in our relationship than there is, uh, there is there. Again, I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone. It's the nature of the current times. There are some fake news. There, are some, there is some desire to pick on the most catchy phrases and strongest statements. So again, I reconcile but by not believing that uh, reconstruction of the Soviet Union is possible and we will just continue this way, building, continuing to build a normal, equal relationship and, and yes, continuing step by step uh, to improve our relationship uh, with the West. And, and by the way, about the Union State, it was also mentioned in the Treaty on Creation of Union State. I read this text this morning and I found one very interesting article there which says that the Union State is being built on the principle of sovereign and equality of states which is also an important theme that, theme that is there and also explains a lot in our position and in discussions that we have. I think that's a good point. I think it's also to George's point that Russia has proven that it is often predatory with other nations' sovereignty, but that is just well, my comment. Memorandum. Um, pa papers don't always hold them to their... I don't know where we're getting the music from, but uh, let's proceed with questions. <laughs> Uh, yes, ma'am, please go ahead. If you could just speak up. Okay, I try to speak loudly. There you go. Yeah, uh, I want to just follow up on this treaty of union state between Belarus and Russia. Do you understand correctly that this document exists only on paper, and can we say that it can be buried? Because uh, you said that um, the uh, in preamble it says that uh, states should keep their sovereignty, but on the other hand, as I understand, there should be very lot of like bodies, a lot of joint bodies created between the countries. So I just wonder, like, what is the future of this document? Can it just be buried? Thank you. In all honesty, I don't know, but it's not a document that exists only on paper. It's not a document that can be buried. It is so much to this document. It's a lengthy one. And I just urge you to also read it and to see that beyond these many bodies that are to be created in accordance with the uh, with this treaty and there is no timeline there there are no deadlines uh, there are even some instances of wording as cooperation progresses and so on but there are more important things in the document that have already been implemented like rights of citizens of Belarus or citizens of Russia when they travel to Belarus or travel to Russia uh, like some restrictions that exist for other country citizens, they uh, are not existing for Belarusians and Russians in Belarus in accordance with this document. So there are good things in the document that are not that on the surface, are not that interesting to analyze from the geopolitical point of view, but that are really useful and beneficial for the people. So I disagree. Can I, can I go Please to go ahead. The gentleman from Lithuania. Uh, I, when I said earlier that I was struck by the skepticism of Lithuanians from MOD, MF, uh, Foreign Affairs, and, and so on, uh, the Foreign Ministry, uh, and my sense was that it was tied to this nuclear power plant. That I mean, that was the that was the driving factor, uh, and I, I certainly would not blame uh, our Lithuanian allies for being concerned from a where they're located by the plant, but also being skeptical um, uh, in, a, in a broader sense. Uh, but it's in, it's in the best interest of everybody that Belarus is self-reliant and sovereign. And, and I think uh, through business, through investment, uh, finding ways, the Chinese are certainly in there. When you go through the Minsk airport, everything is in English, Russian, and Chinese, which tells you how many 
business people are, are coming in and out of there. So the West has to, I think, counter that, offer a, a better alternative. And this is why I want to return to Germany. Uh, why Germany, I think, has the, the critical role here. Germany has a great partnership with Lithuania, with the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group. This has been a model for all of the EFP battle groups. Uh, Germany is the leader with, inside the European Union. It's our most important ally probably in the world, or should we should be pursuing the relationship with Germany as if it is our most important partner. They have the, the moral authority to help keep pressure on human rights, but at the same time, also uh, finding a way to navigate to get the, to achieve the broader strategic objectives. And I, I think this is a great opportunity for Germany to step forward the way they did in the Minsk process. You gotta follow up on that. But I mean, there's, it seems to me that they would be at the core of um, achieving stability and security in this part of Europe uh, in a way that would, um, that they can uh, avoid giving Russia the pretext to do something that would literally threaten, increase the threat to Lithuania or Poland or, or Latvia. Great. Uh, we had a question back there, so I'll start with you and then and then the gen and then you can respond. Or do you want to respond to this directly right now? If I yeah, please. He was going to say Quick. what a great point I made. I think was the. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great point, and also it's in, li <laughs> in Lithuania's <laughs> interest to have sovereign and I don't know in independent democratic Belarus, but. Can you then explain how more uh, independent energy on energy independence Belarus, because the project is financed by Russia, uh, by Russia, by built by Russia, etc. Mm -hmm. So Belarus is becoming more energy dependent. So how does it correlate with the wish to have more to see Belarus more sovereign and an independent country? No, that, that's a very fair point. Uh, I think what I had in mind was more about uh, Germany being the country that, for example, through the EU or separately, because they obviously um, are still in nuclear power themselves, uh, to provide the assurance for everybody by having observers, engineers. So in other words, uh, confidence building measure where Belarus would invite recognized experts, and somebody like Germans, that would have the uh, sort of credibility to be there uh, to help reduce anxiety that Lithuanians might have. I think we heard the, the Deputy Foreign Minister, this, this is gonna happen, so how do we build confidence uh, among all the neighbors that would be in a, in, that are in the risk area? Uh, the energy independence, that, that, is a, that is another great question. Um, and I, I don't know what the long-term, uh, Ole could probably answer better than me, what the long-term relationship is once the power plant is, is constructed. Um, but I imagine that's a tether that's going to be there for a long time. By the way, which is true of every other country in Europe as well, almost nobody except Norway and Great Britain is able to produce sufficient energy for themselves. So I'll just comment on this really briefly to note that, first of all, most of Belarus's refined petrochemical products do go, as you know, through the port of Klaipeda. So there is this interdependence a little bit with Lithuania already. But then if potentially down the road, the electricity from the plant were to be sold on a bilateralized basis to EU countries. That could create a new level of independence from Russian sources as long as the contracts were not structured to go through Russia, which is an open question, and I don't know if that's possible. Uh, but the gentleman in the back has been waiting patiently uh, right there, yes, third from the back row. Can I stand up or? Please, and introduce yourself. Hello. My Hello, my name is Jacob Levitan. Uh, I'm here independently. Uh, my question's for the entire panel. Uh, and uh, I was wondering about Russian geostrategic, uh, what your views on Russian geostrategic drive are for Eastern Europe, uh, whether, in your opinion, it's more of a political pragmatic uh, view or kind of a new urge to regather the Rus lands, uh, Rus lands, especially kind of given the rising quasi prominence of people like Dugin and uh, kind of a restoring of uh, Ivan Ilyin's uh, uh, views in uh, Russia, in the Kremlin. Thank you. Okay, Sandy, you want to start off? Sure. Well, I, I think Russia does have ambitions to uh, kind of reestablish at least a position of dominance or hegemony over the former Soviet uh, space. Uh, and I think that's what we've been seeing in practice. Uh, if you go back to the war in Georgia, but especially since 2014. 
Uh, and I think that's the, the, the reason why we need to push back. And I think it goes to George Chapivsky's question. Uh, it may take a while. P Putin is, uh, I think, quite con convinced that this is a, uh, a war uh, with the West. And uh, you know, we need to wake up to recognize that uh, you know, we need to consider ourselves at war if he considers himself at war. But at the same time, we shouldn't be uh, taking up a zero-sum approach, uh, as Celeste said earlier. Uh, even if Russia insists that Belarus needs to choose or at least if, accept a much more limited uh, degree of uh, freedom of maneuver uh, and be reined in in terms of its uh, economics, that uh, we can continue to convey the message that countries like Belarus should not have to choose. Uh, we should uh, offer the possibilities of mutually beneficial cooperation, Euro-Atlantic integration, making clear this is not directed against Russia but this is for the benefit of uh, security and stability in the region. Uh, <coughs> so I think uh, you know, the EU may have more tools to, uh, to help Belarus uh, strengthen its sovereignty, uh, to uh, become a more resilient country. Uh, we need to navigate a, a, a careful uh, course, not to uh, provoke the Russians to, to overreact to some of the things that we do. But we shouldn't be the ones that are taking a zero-sum approach, even if Russia I is doing that in the name of a kind of Yalta II uh, redivision of Europe. I would associate my views with <coughs> Sandy. Does anyone else want to jump in on I this? I would just say, I, of course, I, I think that's exactly right. But I would emphasize, it, it, I would argue it's more useful to think not in terms of a Russian reason. You didn't quite say this, but let me characterize, uh, characterize it which is there are different reasons and different elites, different pieces of the Russian public for those who support such a, you know, the, the gathering of Russian lands. Some is cultural, some is aspiration to history, some is the Russian Orthodox Church, some is business interest. You know, it's nice to have the advantage of the Eurasian Economic Union uh, when you're negotiating contracts and not have to compete fairly with uh, Western companies that maybe can, can offer better terms of trade. So for, for me, when I, when I think about this puzzle, I, I, I resist the notion that everyone in Russia uh, um, supports this idea. Well, first of all, not all do. And they support it for different reasons. And so maybe that's excessively cynical. But I, I do think it's important that there are, uh, there are multiple reasons why that frame is persuasive to many in Russia. And, uh, and there are many in Russia who don't accept that frame because that frame comes at a cost. It comes at a cost in business terms because when you adopt that frame, you're losing out on Russia, the promise of Russian integration in the WTO, for example. Uh, you're losing out on the promise of uh, private investment more broadly, not just within uh, certain specific bilateral relationships. And so I think it's actually contested, and we should remember that, that uh, there are different views in Russia and different interests. You don't always see them expressed. Uh, in you know political debates and political leadership because of the nature of the political system in Russia, but I would encourage everyone to think in terms of diversity of interests uh, and take it down a layer when you think about the challenges over the next decade or so in dealing with Russia in in the neighborhood, but also more broadly. I, I've seen everything I need to see uh, in the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait with Russia seizing three Ukrainian vessels. Of 24 sailors are still in jail somewhere in uh, in Russia. Um, and if the West does not uh, really crack down on this and, and push back on it, then de facto we've, uh, we've recognized their claim to Crimea because the whole point was that the Ukrainian ships were sailing through Russian territorial water, which is complete BS. But if we don't, if we don't continue to shine the light on that and, and pr pressure them, then de facto they've won that. And if that's the case, then I am sure Odessa is next on the menu. Uh, and that they continue, that's the strategic objective is to make sure that the Black Sea is a, uh, continues to be the launching pad into Middle East and uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, for the Russian Federation. So we have really got to uh, have our eyes and ears wide open about this and be very firm. Great, well, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. We are over time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for a fascinating conversation.